Good day. I would like to welcome everyone to this Lunch and Learn webinar this afternoon. Our webinar is sponsored by the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay's Businesses for the Bay Membership Association. Businesses for the Bay helps businesses create and succeed at environmental initiatives that help our local rivers, streams, and ecosystems while getting recognized for their voluntary initiatives by the Trusted Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. This webinar is designed for both the Businesses for the Bay member looking for some new project ideas, as well as folks who are not part of the Businesses for the Bay program yet. Any business in the Chesapeake Bay watershed can get recognized for taking the actions described today through Businesses for the Bay. Before we begin, we have some housekeeping items. I would like to remind everyone that your computers should already be on mute. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please type them into the chat box in the write a message field. Rachel's presentation will last approximately 45 minutes, and then we'll answer questions in the last 10 minutes. That's when we'll take care of the questions that you typed into the chat box. After the webinar, I will email you a survey. Your response will help guide future Businesses for the Bay webinar opportunities, as well as give us useful feedback from today's webinar. We are recording this webinar and will post it on the Businesses for the Bay website later this week. During the webinar, The Economics of Eco-Functioning Spaces, you will learn how to meet Businesses for the Bay membership requirements, save money, increase economic value, and create goodwill in every project that you do. With that, I would like to introduce you to Rachel Toker. She is the founder and president of our Businesses for the Bay networking partner, Urban Ecosystem Restoration. Rachel has over 16 years of experience in commercial and multifamily real estate development, mixed use and mixed income projects, public-private partnerships, and the revitalization of underserved urban areas, as well as environmental sustainability. Rachel is a LEED accredited professional and is certified as a Chesapeake Bay landscape professional. Rachel will spend the next 45 minutes sharing her recent research with us. Take it away, Rachel. Hello, now that I can uh, speak here. Okay. Hello and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Economics of Eco-Functioning Spaces. I'm Rachel Doker, President and CEO of Urban Ecosystem Restoration. UER is a young urban land trust based in the Washington, D.C. area. We focus on the creation, operation, and protection of eco-functioning spaces in the growing cities of the Chesapeake Bay region. Today, we're going to talk about eco-functioning spaces and how they work systematically to meet environmental, social, and economic objectives. As the title of our webinar suggests, we're going to spend a bulk of our time together on the economics of these spaces and how they can create net economic benefit for businesses, particularly those working to meet the Alliance's Businesses for the Bay requirements. In looking at our agenda, You'll see that we're not diving into the core topic immediately. We need to first spend a bit of time putting the economic conversation into a broader context, an analytic framework. This means that I'm going to touch briefly on the why of equal functioning spaces and then move to the what and how of these spaces and their economic benefits to landowners, commercial tenants, employees, and many others. So here we are. We as a global society are busting through global emissions cap targets. Oceans are acidifying as their levels rise. Bird and pollinator populations are deeply suffering and the list goes on. We have some big global problems and many people don't even know it. And if they do know it, many people don't know what they can do about it. I just mentioned some global environmental problems, and global problems are linked to local action, and vice versa. These are interdependent systems, especially when it comes to one of the big common denominators, land use choices. Let me say that again, land use choices. 
Our land use choices are fundamental to resolving these major environmental problems at every geographic level, and they are in our hands. These are our land use choices today, and not just ours, but those of most of the countries around the world. These choices, particularly as they've been implemented for the last 50 to 100 years, have and continue to produce the problems we're seeing locally, regionally, and globally, especially as they intensify and expand. Today's webinar will focus on commercial land use choices across growing metropolitan regions. And in order to change 50 to 100 years of entrenched land use practices and related thinking, we need to not only create ecologically restorative land uses across the urban landscape, we need to create restorative designs and operations that are economically feasible for the private sector. <clears throat> and we need to use those designs and operations to address social concerns, increase public health and education, and promote community cohesion. And this needs to happen across the full spectrum of socioeconomic groups and industries. So here's our Chesapeake Bay watershed. And when Europeans arrived here in the 17th century, diverse forests stretched across 95% of the watershed. 40 to 50% of the forest were cleared by the 1800s. And today, despite reforestation in many areas, less than 58% is left. Of what we have left, 60% of that is divided into disconnected fragments and forest loss continues every day as our current land use choices and practices prevail. It's also noteworthy that private landowners own nearly 80% of all Chesapeake forests. Now, I can tell you that we need to reform our land use choices so that they not only stop damaging our ecosystems, but actually strengthen them. But in growing cities, most landowners and businesses are only going to change if those restorative choices carry economic and social benefit. Getting restorative land uses and associated site designs and operations to meet that bar requires that owners, designers, and consultants adopt a new analytic framework that can get them there. Okay, and that's the why we're here today and why I need you to bear with me for about five more minutes as we talk about this new framework for thinking about our landscapes and land use choices, and then we'll move into how we get to implementation of that framework. So let's talk about the analytical framework we need to use for the rest of our webinar today. Okay. So here we've got a triple bottom line framework. It reflects the importance of environmental, social, and economic outcomes. I'll sometimes refer to them as ESE outcomes or framework. And at the center, all of these kinds of goals are not only being achieved, but they're interacting with each other in mutually reinforcing ways. As we talk about landscapes, built and natural, we want to look at the most efficient and effective combinations of landscape and building systems that can accomplish all of these goals and get us into the center. The way we change commercial land use choices from destructive to restorative is to connect them to this ESE framework and its framework goals and bake the economics of doing that into the private market. I want to emphasize that to achieve all of these goals, we have to start with the environment. When you start with the environment, you launch into restorative thinking and outcomes. If you start with one of the other categories, it's much harder to avoid the ruts that most of us are currently in. And from there, it becomes too hard and too expensive to fit in all the environmental objectives. So we start with a system that produces all of our environmental performance outputs. These outputs can then be married to an entire set of social and economic performance outputs. But getting these kinds of results requires not only starting with the environment, 
but also selecting or designing the right systems to achieve ESC goals, and then operating and maintaining them for ESC results. So now, let's talk about the right systems to get us to our goals. Eco-functioning spaces are the landscape systems that UER advances for restorative land use in all property types. Eco-functioning spaces take the concepts we've been discussing, bring them down to the site level, and help landowners and developers, and in some cases, tenants or community associations, implement them. So eco-functioning spaces. This is a diagram that shows the layers of benefit that an eco-functioning space generates working as a system. What it's showing you are three layers. At base, we see in color how our environmental goals are addressed in an integrated way and spark natural cycles that power the system. Second, we weave education and engagement programming throughout the space to drive the system further and promote social goals within the space. And third, we get value drivers that spin off from the system and create on-site economic value. Now let's walk through some examples of these layers of benefit with the help of three case studies. Here are three case studies that we'll talk about today. On the left, you see the avenue, or what used to be called Square 54 in Washington, D.C. In the middle, there's Karst and Associates in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. This is an office property, um, actually a landscape architect. And on the right, you see a Prairie Crossing, which is uh, an entire residential uh, subdivision development that was done as what we call a conservation development in Grays Lake, Illinois, not too far from Chicago. These three case studies sit along a spectrum of natural to engineered eco-functioning spaces. They also fall along a spectrum of location from dense urban core to ex-urban. We'll talk about the different case studies at specific points to illustrate different choices and trade-offs that can be made while meeting environmental, social, and economic goals. Let's start to, to take a deeper dive into our environmental goals. And as I said before, we start with the environment. So for the performance goals, we're going to just summarize quickly environmental and social performance, um, and then we're going to move to economics. So at UER, we don't believe in siloed solutions. We believe in making every square foot count. So for eco-functioning spaces, we require environmental performance in a minimum of these four categories simultaneously. Native habitat, clean water, climate change, and air. At UER, we also always look for ways to go one step further and recreate natural systems and cycles that produce and sustain these environmental goals on site and incorporate them so as to benefit built systems. This is usually the most cost-effective way to achieve optimal environmental performance. However, it's not always possible or even desirable for certain locations, and so we also support partially engineered systems, as long as they incorporate natural systems to the maximum extent possible and serve all environmental goals. We also pay attention and seek to reduce operations and maintenance practices that detract from our performance goals. For example, we discourage the use of petroleum-fueled machines, like many leaf blowers and mowers, or the overuse of manufactured inputs, like pesticides, herbicides, mulches, and fertilizers, other than compost. So as I said, setting in motion the natural cycles appropriate for your location is generally the most cost-effective landscape system. And I just want us to take a moment and look together at forests as an example of a cost-effective environmental system. Forests are more than a collection of individual trees. They consist of diverse species of trees, shrubs, and ground covers that serve a variety of roles. Forests have vertical structures and living soils. 
They automatically respond and adapt to seasonal patterns, and they regenerate themselves in response to damage. As a result, they perform much like human communities do in terms of structure and cooperative specialized roles. When the leaves fall, they provide insulation for winter and the right nutrients for the microbes and plant roots in the soils. Those nutrients cycle back into the plant and soil communities, enrich the trees that drop them, and ensure that the soils are porous and ready to soak up the rain. They need no additives from outside the system loop other than interventions to manage invasive species. When they're healthy, they're powered at little or no cost to us, and nature maintains the system indefinitely. When the Europeans arrived, no one was out with leaf blowers clearing the forest floors so that the plants could be at their best. And no one came out every spring to mulch the forest trees and shrub layers to make sure they would survive and thrive. Nature took care of it. Now, I've just sung the praises of pristine forests as eco-functioning spaces, but not everyone loves forests as I do. Every natural landscape system in urban space will generate some amount of tension with prevailing aesthetic norms and local preferences, which will affect our social goals and related economic goals. However, if a natural system is a good fit for a site environmentally and economically, there are many ways to manage these tensions, particularly with placemaking strategies and education. This is one of the ways that UER or land trust like it can help produce the convergence of environmental, social, and economic goals. Next, we have um, eco-functioning space social goals. Social goals are inherently important in their own right, but we're going to see how, when they are deeply connected to our environmental system, we get broader and deeper impact. This also then furthers economic goals on both revenue and cost reduction sides. So we want social, goal, social performance goals derived from or supported by our environmental system. The social and health benefits of time in nature are being increasingly documented these days. If designed and used properly, eco-functioning spaces can build community cohesion, educate and engage people of all demographics and promote physical and mental health in so many ways. Time in green outdoor space is correlated with bodily health, stress reduction, worker and student productivity, mental cognition, and the ability to concentrate, particularly for urban dwellers. I wanna just emphasize that it's not just any kind of green space that shows the greatest value. It's the kind of green space that is visually interesting. It causes people to linger and take time to experience it. The greatest benefits occur when we observe, listen, exercise, or otherwise engage in the space. The presence of bird calls or animals, the rustle of leaves, these are part of the health benefit. We also have to note that to take advantage of these benefits, there has to be a place to locate oneself, an invitation to stay through seating, sizing, configuration, and relationship to built surroundings. The space design and operation may also include incentives for socializing, nature play for children, or active recreation, like offering nature trails for walking, running, or biking. And now, we come to our economics. Ta-da, here we are, the core of today's webinar and the most complicated part as well. How does this all make financial sense to the businesses of our watershed? Well, let's dive in and see. To really assess net economic benefits, we need to consider at least these five economic categories, I sometimes call them buckets, um, and which act as levers within our system. While we might love to have no costs and revenues that look like lottery winnings, our ultimate goal is to maximize the spread between revenues and costs over a specific time horizon so that we can achieve net economic benefit within our ESE framework. 
We also want to manage risk and access subsidies or other financial support whenever possible. One thing we need to be cognizant of as we have this conversation is that we're comparing land use and landscape choices here to figure out what is likely to provide the greatest incremental benefit. So I'm talking about scenarios in which a developer, a landowner, a commercial tenant is contemplating taking action, whether it's to develop a property, design a space, reinvigorate a space, choose a location, and the like. If, if you are that developer or tenant, here you are, wondering whether there's a business case for making the choice for an eco-functioning space. You're gonna examine incremental differences. How much more value can I get from one space than another? Or how much more will a restorative design cost to build and operate as compared to one off the factory line? Or maybe I should do nothing and stay right where I am. Under any circumstance, if you're operating on a property, you're spending money. So the question will be, how can I create an eco-functioning space with better economics than what I have now or what I can get with the other guy? Well, the final answer will depend on a number of variables, but we can get a good sense within different categories and key distinctions how our numbers shake out when we manipulate these various economic levers. But key variables and assumption, assumptions will have a large impact on how we make the business case for a particular property and which levers can be most effective to achieve a positive spread. So we're gonna look at some of these key distinctions and key categories, and then move into our case studies, some rough data points and some hypothetical examples that will show us how we get to net economic benefit, looking at something between a one to five year time horizon and how the environmental and social performance can drive the spread between revenues and costs. We'll, dis we'll discuss value creation first, and then we're gonna look at first costs and cost reduction. Then we'll take, take a quick moment for risk management and we're gonna sort of speed through subsidies um, because that is not the focus in this webinar today. Um, then we'll briefly talk about UER and the role of land trusts and nonprofits in making the business case and take a look at our B4B requirements. And then we'll move into questions. So um, it's very hard to generalize economic arguments across um, a lot of different property use types, um, owner occupant types, and certainly it will matter whether we're talking about um, whether we're comparing sort of open space to open space or whether we're comparing rentable square feet to eco-functioning space. But what I, as you look at some of these key distinctions, what I want to highlight are a few questions that we need to be thinking about as we go through the rest of the webinar. One is, what's our baseline set of economic assumptions for comparison? So what's our best life cycle economic scenario under a traditional development outlook or an outlook with primary, primarily economic goals? What is the, in other words, what is the opportunity cost of implementing eco-functioning space? Two is what does our target market expect of our property type or class? How in, and how entrenched are those expectations? Three is what are, are your opportunities for revenue generation? Are there rents here or is it just a matter of projected resale value? Are there possible income streams you could consider with an eco-functioning space that you can't without one? And four, how many untested assumptions do you feel you need to make based on past practice because they're safe and traditional? So what I mean by that is, um, are you willing to go without an irrigation system even if you haven't before? Or are you willing to allow small animals on your property like snakes or foxes? In these variables, I'll just mention those being biological controls in many cases. Um, so in, in these variables, a lot depends on what you believe about people, what is possible, and what the future holds for us. 
It also depends a lot on what you believe about the role of education, technical assistance, programming, and marketing in changing human perceptions, behaviors, and preferences. Oops. So let's launch in. We're going to go through, um, let's just make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what we're talking about on value and revenue, and then we're going to look very closely at one of our case studies. So when I talk about the lever of value and revenue, I'm talking about, uh, about three to six things, depending on your property type. One is income stream, which generally means rental rates. But there could be other areas of income from the property, depending on its type and what uses it offers. Two is speed of tenant absorption or low vacancy rates. So that's a matter of how quickly do, does your property become occupied and stay occupied. Three, tenant turnover rates. Are people leaving your property? Are they breaking leases? Are, are there a tremendous number of transaction costs associated with changing occupants and that aren't anticipated in particular? Four, what's the reputation of the property and your company by virtue of this property? And do occupants feel a sense of connection to site and a sense that they're meeting social responsibility? And five, for office tenants and for tenants, um, office tenants in particular, an ability to attract quality employees, higher levels of productivity and re reduced absenteeism in your employees. Um, these benefits have actually been shown um, uh, to potentially outweigh most any cost, <laughs> including increased rental rates. And for retailers, um, how much money are people spending in your establishment? Um, and if it increases in relationship to an eco-functioning space, that also can be a component of value. Now, for, the, for our case study, we're looking at the avenue, which is a mixed-use, it's a high-end mixed-use trophy asset in the heart of Washington, D.C. It's owned by Boston Properties. It consists of 2.6 acres of office and residential, uh, it was new construction, amid the George Washington University campus area. The central courtyard is a stunning oasis in the heart of this development and it's slightly under 40,000 square feet near the center. And you can sort of see it as a, a blue square in the middle of the circle on the right. Is a water feature that's made to capture stormwater runoff from one of the green roofs, in addition to capturing direct rainfall. It uses a chemical free filtration system. So the fountain water is safe for birds and other wildlife. The aquatic vegetation is placed within the water feature in perforated filters, planters, allowing the roots to grow directly in the water and provide supplemental filtration. After the water leaves the fountain, it's then reused in the courtyard for irrigation, for irrigating the landscape, and it also can replenish the fountain itself um, if it becomes depleted due to evaporation. So, Hopefully you can see from the pictures, they don't really do it justice, but it's a gorgeous space um, that, as you can see from the site plan, basically um, takes over the center. And, it, it'll, and as they point out, the project has been a resounding commercial success, in part due to the design of the courtyard space and the fact that there's no such thing as a bad or a back view. I'll just mention that this project it was delivered in 2011, not too long out of our Great Recession. And since then, it hit every index of value creation that we've talked about. When it came on the market, it had the highest rents in DC, at least up in five months, with essentially no vacancies since then. And just to put that in context, most buildings lease up in 12 to 24 months. The, um, the property owners, although they haven't done a systematic study, they're guessing that between two to 5% of the rental premiums they got are attributable to the quality green outdoor amenities like the courtyard. And according to the property manager, tenants have a powerful connection to this courtyard and, and it is extremely popular and well used. 
Now, 2.5% for rental premiums is slightly on the low side compared to some other data that's out there suggesting uh, you can get 7% rental premiums um, for quality green space. But these rents were at the top of the market at the time, so there really wasn't much room to go up. Um, in other cases, like a Montreal suburb, where there was an eco-sustainable development built close to the city's green belt, they saw 15 to 27% increases in property values due to the green market premium. Now, we're gonna just move into costs and cost savings quickly. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna revisit the avenue in just a second. Um, but for costs and cost savings, um, they depend heavily, obviously, on existing conditions, location, prevailing labor and materials costs, and how an owner is staffed, among many other things. But we're, we're going to forge ahead here and look at our case studies and look at some hypothetical examples that we can manipulate to see the economic opportunities that can exist here with eco-functioning space. So when we talk about costs, we need to look at the full set of costs and cost savings of our landscape system and its interaction with our building, not just construction costs. For these purposes, I'm going to lump actual installation in the early plant establishment period together because they occur before the system is in full operation, so to speak. And I'll refer to this early group of costs as the first cost. So for this slide and the next three, let's examine these first two items, the first cost and operations and maintenance because that's where the bulk of costs and cost savings are going to come in. And I'm going to propose to you <clears throat> that eco-functioning spaces fall roughly into four sort of cost categories. As we go through this discussion, compare in your mind low cost or traditional outdoor landscapes that you would commonly see for a comparable property. When you do, remember that when faced with very low first costs, you always want to consider life cycle costs to really figure out your economic benefit. If a landscape ultimately has higher operations and maintenance costs over the life of the property or frequent and high replacement costs, particularly if it has poor environmental and social goal performance, you're not actually saving money. Okay, the four categories are one, and this is going to be where we talk about the avenue. High first cost, high maintenance costs, and no cost savings, but high value or strong risk management in a high risk context. Second category is high first costs, but large operational savings with maintenance savings or controlled costs. Third is mid level first costs, medium high, with low to no operating costs and low to no maintenance costs. And then fourth is really low or even potentially negative first cost with low operating and maintenance costs. And this is a, akin to um, our prairie crossing case study that we're gonna get to in a few slides. So this first category I'm describing, this high first cost, high maintenance cost with really not, not really ha having any cost savings, but high value creation or high risk management, this is, akin to the Avenue case study. Um, they don't have huge costs in terms of operations and maintenance, but they really don't have any anything you'd call cost savings um, other than reusing the water for, for irrigation. Where it's, um, it's really the value creation of that space that makes it economically justifiable. Um, UER does not prefer this kind of economic justification particularly where, where the entire economic justification rests on raising rental rates. This, this creates just um, a tremendous, you know, a, a constant drive toward unaffordability. Um, so generally, UER believes that if you're not achieving any operations or maintenance cost savings with an eco-functioning space, then something is probably off. But let's talk about are two um, 
are two uh, mid-level categories. So in the cost, quarter, cost, cost category number two, where we're talking about a high first cost with strong operational savings and controlled maintenance costs or maintenance savings, let's look at a hypothetical scenario. So in, a, in the top above the blue line, there's a base case uh, scenario that's just an example taken from a, a basic real estate finance class. And in this case, you've got um, a 50 unit apartment building, uh, you're charging average rent of $1,900 a month, you've got some other income, $500 per year with a vacancy rate of 3% and operating expenses at 425,000. And you're getting an, a net operating income of 648,548. So let's, let's now compare that with say we have an equal functioning space in our second cost category, which means that it's a high first cost. So let's say this is a highly engineered, um, natural and engineered hybrid system. In this kind of scenario, usually you have, to, in order to achieve high operational savings, um, and it may be, a, it may also have high costs because it's in a tight urban space or it has cutting edge features and there are a lot of soft costs. We don't know, but we know that in this cost category, you're striving for large savings in building and system operations. So in this case, we're imagining a situation where water is being filtered through the eco-functioning space and recycled into the building, probably for reuse in toilets and any other fixture that can use gray water that might be there. Um, maybe it's a laundry, maybe um, it's, it's a cleaning system of some kind or a power washing system of some kind. Um, maybe it's living walls inside of the building. But basically, you're, you're taking huge amounts of potable water out of, um, out of use so that you can get that large water cost savings and you're maximizing tree cover and other kind of vegetation cover so that you're maximizing energy efficiency savings as well. This is, this is possible and one interesting um, data point that I caught was that there's one study in Davis, California showing that just reduced pavement and increased natural vegetation in a neighborhood reduce home energy bills by 33 to 50 percent compared to surrounding neighborhoods without that intervention. So we know that eco-functioning spaces can produce energy savings as well as water savings. And then in this case, we're using as much natural system as possible so that we're reducing as much maintenance as possible. But really we're getting operational savings through the building and the landscape. And it's done in an attractive social way so that your vacancy rate drops your rents go up slightly. I did 7% in this case, which is reasonable given the data. Um, and your operating expenses go up a little bit because you need trained personnel to manage it, but they go down because you're getting so much utility cost savings. And here you wind up with net operating income at 765,734, which is up 117,186 and you get a return on your investment in under four years. Okay, so let's look at one other cost category. <clears throat> Excuse me. One other cost category comparing uh, against our their same base case, where we're looking at mid-level first costs with really low operating costs. So here you don't have all the same technology. You may not be capturing all the same operational savings through the building, but um, you're also not spending as much money. Now, frankly, 350,000 um, for an eco-functioning space that's really basically a non-site ecological restoration is, as I would think, fairly high given the data that I've seen. But I wanted to, to sort of strain the model just to show you what we're talking about here. So even if this were 350,000, we're talking largely about a natural system restoration. Maybe we've got a treatment train with some bioswales and rain garden mixed with whatever native habitat you've got. And um, in one of our case studies, 
that was basically 125,000 cost scenario. So 350,000 should be quite high. Um, and here we're only we only bump the vacancy rent rate down one percent instead of two percent. Um, where our rents maybe increased a little bit less, five percent. Um, we're still getting NOI up by 89,134 with a return on investment in under four years. So these middle level scenarios where um, you don't have super low first costs, but you don't have super high first costs and you're getting savings and you're getting social benefit and you're connecting them all together to increase your spread. This is where the exciting opportunity really is. Um, but we've got one, one more case study for our last cost category, which is um, very low first cost. In fact, in this case, we could call it negative first cost of $1.4 million. And what I mean by that is that this conservation development, when compared with what residential, a standard residential subdivision was going to cost, saved $1.4 million in first cost. But that's a lot of money. <laughs> um, so now, even though, so they don't, they don't have to get a return on that investment. Um, but what we know about Prairie Crossing is that now their expenses, um, which are spread over a, a community of 359 homes, are about $1,200 a year. Um, their, well, their homeowner assessment fees are about $1,200 a year, which includes maintaining a fitness center, and it includes a lot of um, turf mowing costs for some of the common areas. So it's not just conservation areas, but that's a, a normal HOA cost in that area and for that size property. Um, we, we, it's also the case that they've got a tremendous amount of, it was originally farmland that was restored back to its ecological roots as prairie, ponds, and wetlands. They also have a working organic farm and do a lot with sustainable food production, but our focus primarily here is on the conservation areas. They have nature trails and they, they go out and volunteer together on their environmental stewardship committee um, to maintain the space and build community cohesion around it. Um, now, they don't do all of their maintenance with volunteer labor. They do use contractors and they have some professionally trained residents who help oversee the land management plan. Um, most of their O&M costs are for prescribed burns. And most of those costs are really with burns that are nearby to homes or fuel storage areas because they don't want to get that wrong. Um, their invasive species management is also a huge cost uh, because their the earliest interventions were not effective and so there's a bigger problem that they have now than they might have if they'd been able to keep it under control from the beginning and mowing is a big cost as well home resale values by the way are slightly higher than those in the surrounding area Okay, so let's talk briefly about risk management. Um, this, the value of risk management can vary basically based on perceived risks. Um, but the truth is that in our region, we will increasingly face extreme weather. And um, while property insurers may, um, may cover those costs, there also are attempts to exclude weather-related damage from insurance coverage. So this is just increasingly important, um, well, for property owners and frankly for investors as well to consider. So in this case, I just love this story. Um, the Carson Associates built a treatment train basically around their building where they restored a, a nearby stream cited their building so that it could be restored, built in bioswale, biodetention, permeable pavers, and rain garden. Um, they did happen to get a grant. The, the costs of this installation were $125,000. This is in a space near Cleveland, Ohio. 
Um, and as you can see, in, in an extremely heavy rain, their, their neighbors were under a foot of water and they had nothing going on. Um, so they're, they are well positioned to protect their property, their building, and themselves in even more extreme weather. And last, just to quickly cover um, subsidies, we're not going to cover any of these right now, but I do just want people to understand these things do exist. Some of them are in their infancy. Um, as green financing and um, credit trading evolves, we certainly hope that these are going to provide subsidies and incentives for urban areas as well as outer areas um, to promote eco-functioning spaces. Now, I'll just say a quick word about UER and our role in this whole process. UER helps people design eco-functioning spaces, which can provide economic value in their own right. But UER enhances value through wraparound services focused on operations and maintenance, including community education, programming, and reliable stewardship. This also allows the eco-functioning space to generate more value, particularly as it matures over time, both for the property and also for the surrounding neighborhoods. So as you've hopefully seen, eco-functioning spaces seek to achieve all of the performance goals of the B4B &B program and the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement. So when planning for optimized eco-functioning spaces, you can actually create numerous B4B &B projects that build out an eco-functioning space and ultimately satisfy most or all of the watershed agreement categories. At the same time, you can have the pride of knowing that you're creating a world of change as you make every square foot count. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I have a I have a if you have other questions other questions please do serve through the chat box Thank you Rachel um stay on that screen cuz I'm going to read the question and then you can unmute yourself in a second um the email that I thought was really helpful to just share with the group is, is there a difference Green infrastructure, Rachel, if you could explain a little bit what about what green infrastructure is for the folks on the phone who don't know. Spaces. Yeah. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Can you hear me? Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, Yes, so we get that questioning, but we get that question a fair amount. Um, and there's a, also a fair amount of overlap in green infrastructure and eco-functioning spaces. But there are a couple of ways um, that we differ. First of all, as I said early on, although it, although we, we have you know, set environmental goals, uh, through, you know, whether it's air, air quality improvement, heat island management, climate change, and so on and so forth, all of which have to be met. And so here's a chart where certain things that are called green infrastructure really don't meet all those requirements um, for us unless they're part of a larger system, part of a larger, say, treatment train. So cisterns, permeable pavements, rain barrels, they don't provide, well, permeable pavers, this is a bad example because it's got plantings. Um, they don't really provide habitat, let's say. They don't do very much for climate change, certainly the cisterns and the rain barrels. Um, they don't do that much for air quality improvement. Um, if, they're, if they're vegetated permeable pavers, that, that can change a little bit. Most interlocking permeable pavers are not vegetated. Um, but in the, there's, there's the one step further piece which is eco-functioning spaces, we ultimately strive to create natural cycles and systems through eco-functioning spaces. So unless that's an intentional piece of the green infrastructure, now some people use green infrastructure just to mean 
any restored uh, green space that sort of serves its natural function and manages stormwater, uh, that's much more aligned to an eco-functioning space, whereas sort of the uh, formal definitions of EPA, uh, there, there's overlap, but, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Um, when green infrastructure's sole goal is stormwater management, um, that's where you see the difference. It, it, the, the fact that it's driven by a siloed motivation can lead to siloed results and eco-functioning spaces are driven by an integrated vision. And so we always seek an integrated performance, if that makes sense. Thanks, Rachel. Excellent. Um, Robert just asked on the chat box, in case it's not open for everybody to see, whether or not uh, the slideshow is available for download. And it will be um, after this webinar is complete. I will email everybody on the who uh, registered for the webinar. I will email everybody a survey as well as a link on our website, which I just stuck in the chat box, that will have the slides as well as the recorded webinar. Um, so another question that we've received is, what are some ways that UER, Refill Organization, tries to engage people with eco-functioning spaces, particularly people who may not feel drawn to the outdoors? And this is important, knowing that one of the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement's goals is community engagement. Right. So, um, there are lots of, there's sort of a, a whole range of ways that um, we try to engage people in this space. And everybody's sort of got their own tolerance level for uh, being outside, for in, in, in urban areas, you know, where people spend most of their time inside. Um, they have all kind of different tolerance levels for either being outside or being in natural space. Um, so, one great way that we like to engage people is to put artwork in the green infrastructure. Artwork in a way that, that respects uh, green infrastructure, eco-functioning space, I should say, um, in a way that respects it and maybe even highlights it. Um, so certain kinds of sculpture, particularly what I call stormwater art, um, and in fact, on our website under our resources page, there's a link to Artful Rainwater Design, which is a wonderful um, website and group in Pennsylvania that sort of has nice ways to engage people. Um, some of the pictures use a little bit more hardscaping and stonework and less vegetation than UER might advocate for, but they are beautiful. Um, we might hold a meditation session or a yoga session. Um, it may be just a matter of putting out the right kinds of seating, or um, it could be that we would run a pop-up um, a pop-up cart. So one thing that um, one set of practices that UER likes to borrow from are the early practices of bids, um, business improvement districts, particularly in the DC region. So um, I'm dating myself, but a number of years back when DC wasn't quite as high end as it is today, and people, there were a lot of people loath to go into parts of the city, and but businesses really wanted more traffic and lively streets. They set up bids, and there would be um, <clears throat> there would be sort of outdoor concierges um, where people would stand and and help visitors wayfind or um you know find out where they were going they would make people feel safe they would tell people what was around um, they might have pamphlets they might have information they were at least a smiling face that could point people to where they wanted to go that's another concept that we would use um, in certain kinds of eco-functioning space to draw people out um, and uh, there are other things like decorating trees and shrub trunks with um, with little um, ornaments or lights. And another thing is photo contests and photo shoots of the space that get people out just to snap pictures. And it, it increases also their observation of the space. 
So there's a whole range of ways that we would get people out there um, in addition to nature walks and bird walks and such. Um, so it's the sky is the limit when it comes to engagement and placemaking. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and thank you, Rachel, for that inspiring presentation. With that, we are going to uh, close the webinar. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email me or Rachel at CC Rachel when I send out the survey to everybody. This is the friendly reminder to please fill out that survey that you're going to receive via email. Uh, thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon.